I don't know of any announcements or anything, except that we're glad you're here. This is first Sunday, so we'll have communion in church this morning. And uh, this is the uh, third of four sessions with Paul. And uh, there'll be maybe a couple more people come in. Uh, and uh, so, Paul, welcome again. We're glad you're here. So it's your time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, very much. Uh, Matt, I had a special treat here just a minute ago for my dear friends from Mountain View Days. Uh, Mary McLaughlin is here with us. Mm -hmm. And Mary uh, taught history for us uh, many, many years. And uh, she has uh, been visiting the church here and uh, decided to come down Good. to a class. So we're, we're just particularly doubly thrilled that you're here uh, with us today. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's, it's important, I think, that I do a little review because it's unusual that people are here every Sunday. And so I want to do a little review before I get into the <coughs> mother load of the Baroque here, as you, as you will see. And that is, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I was going to yeah. darken this a little bit more because it's no, I know. We'll, I'll, we'll darken both of them when, when we're ready to show slides if you want to. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. Is that better now? Yeah. So uh, I am um, wanting to highlight three or four things that we've talked about. The, the, the first thing that we talked about pretty, pretty intensely first day is that the Baroque is a reaction against iconoclasts. Now, the iconoclasts came <coughs> with the Reformation and they started tearing down uh, statues and they started uh, tearing down altars and uh, bolted candles, you name it, they'd tear it down. And, th and this, this kind of played out throughout uh, the history of a certain branch of Protestantism known as Calvinism. The Calvinists, who are so extraordinarily important in American history, were always iconoclasts in their churches. So if you go to a, a, a Congregationalist church in New England, or if you go to a, what, what, what was originally called Puritan churches. Those churches are always bare bones. And they're, and as pointed out, somebody pointed out last week that the chapel out at Dallas Baptist University is an exact copy of the, of the original Baptist church in New England, there in Providence, Rhode Island, only 10 times larger. And that, you know, it's just plain Jane White and if you, if you were in that original church, you were on site, there would be no paintings, no murals, no statues, not even an altar. It would just be a space. Uh, and because, because of that concept, <coughs> there, was, there was a huge reaction against this iconoclastic um, tradition. And uh, it started in Italy so last week we spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at the Italian Baroque. Now, um, so that's number one. It's the, the idea that out of the Counter-Reformation, one of the main aspects was this emphasis on art, this emphasis on murals, this emphasis on painting, and, and, and all the richness of art. And so it is this kind of uh, uh, it's, it's this kind of movement that led to the Baroque. Now, one other thing I, I didn't mention to you last time is that it, if you look at the timeline, you have the Renaissance, and the Renaissance is always, by definition, classical. In other words, they're always looking back to the models in classic, uh, in classical Greek-Roman history, right? And then you, and then you have a period called Mannerism, 
and mannerism, mannerism is the strangest name of art movement of all time because it, it it's, might be a lot of things, but it's never about manners. It's never about doing things in a certain way. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's about, mannerism is about extreme of form, shape, style. And then this is sort of the, the, uh, the pregnancy period for them, what becomes Baroque. And then Baroque is always dated about 1600 to 1789, the French Revolution. And then the next movement, which we won't get into, is the Romantic. And the Romantic movement is the biggest of them all. But the Baroque is saying, these are, these are the two monumental movements in art and all of the arts. So we're gonna we're gonna really zero in on, on the broke the broke aspect of this. Now I want you to uh, try to try to appreciate the fact that it's almost impossible I'll say it is impossible to say that this is starting date for the broke the broke idea is always there hidden in certain subtle ways, but it starts to come out in mannerism and then it just goes boom, explodes. About the time of our good friend El Greco. Now Greco is the earliest of the Baroque painters along Car Caravaggio and a few others. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some slides now. And I want to... <coughs> uh, now get as much light out as possible. If I can. There we go. There we go. We can turn the lights off too yeah, as well. If we could have the lights off, then I think we'll get a pretty good resolution on this. All right, now what I'm about to show you is considered by many people the greatest work of Baroque art. And it's, uh, it would also be on the shortest, the short list of all time greatest artworks. And it, you'd think, it, on the one hand, you'd think, well, isn't that not a very likely candidate for the Baroque? But the, fa the fact of the matter is it, is, it is a quite likely candidate for the Baroque. And, and uh, you'll see why once we get to the big picture here. First of all, this man here, in, see if my little pointer works today. Okay, this man right here is Count Ortiz. Now, Count Ortiz was, a, was the mayor of a, of a small city, but he was very generous to the church, extremely generous to the church. And so they had set aside money. He died, actually, about uh, almost 200 years earlier. But money had been set aside, and they would never decide what to do with it. Finally, they hired El Greco. Now, who is El Greco? El Greco, which means the Greek, was this Greek painter who moved from Greece as a young man to Venice, Rome, and eventually they offered him some patronage in Spain, so he came to Spain and lived in Toledo. Toledo, of course, is the ancient capital of Spain. And so he's commissioned to paint this. Now, the, this is the bottom part of the painting, but I want to show you first, because in some ways this part is very prosaic, very kind of ordinary. But I want to, I want to step up here and show you a few things that are a little hard to do the pointer with. So this man right here is St. Augustine. Now St. Augustine died, you know, a thousand years earlier. This is St. Stephen, the first Christian martyr. What are they doing there? Well, the legend was this man was so beloved that St. Augustine and St. Stephen came to hand bury, to, to take him and bury him. And this, this legend gave him great prestige, right? 
Now you, you might think, uh, why these two particular ones? Well, the most famous of all the, or the last of all the great fathers of the church um, before the uh, uh, Dark Ages so-called was St. Augustine. And St. Augustine sort of established was, was the format for all that was good in the, in the Middle Ages in terms of religion. But you've got to remember something. Martin Luther was an Augustinian friar. And it was St. Augustine that Luther wanted to return to. You know, his idea of the Reformation is very different from ours. His idea of the Reformation is to return the Roman Catholic Church to what it had been, the true Orthodox teachings, the true path as promoted by St. Augustine. And so Luther, in a way, was not a reformer. He was a he was almost a counter-reformer in the fact he wanted to go back to the way things were before, they, a thousand years before. And this idea was very interesting. Now, you hear this idea of going back over and over. For example, the Mormons, Latter-day Saints believe that the early church was the perfect organization. So the, the church, the LDS church worldwide, is a their attempt to model after the early church and how the early church was set up. Could be. And then this here, St. Stephen. Why St. Stephen? Well, St. Stephen, in many ways, is the first saint. Because remember, Christianity starts, and very early on, he gets martyred, and he is a long tradition. Now, in this are all the important officials of the day. And here's a priest on the one side, and then here's a friar over here in the gray. That's a Franciscan, by the way. Now, here you have, right here, if I can find him, this is El Greco. This is a self-portrait of himself. And so there's El Greco. And here is his son, George. Now, El Greco had been married early on. He had a very bad marriage. He swore off marriage. So when he came to Spain, he had a, a, a lifetime relationship with a woman that he acknowledged that they were together, but he would never marry her. But they had a child, and there he is, George. And so he gets in uh, carrying a torch. I assume this is, looks like a torch right here. He gets in and he has a, a grand, you know, kind of a grand time. You know, he's, the children are often in, a, in situations will kind of get, be emphasized and, and that's exactly, so he's front and center on stage, you might say. Now what makes this famous is not what you're seeing here. What, you're, what is above it is what's incredible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you up a little step by step because what you're going to see is the soul of Con Ortiz going up into heaven. Amazing, outlandish in some ways, startling. You'll see. And, and let, let, me, let me say this, one of the few great paintings I've seen in person, this is in Toledo. And it, it's mammoth, mammoth, it's huge. You can't hardly get it in a photo. But it is, it is, he must have worked years on it because it's just such a fabulous piece of work. And so I want to show you here. I'm going to ease up here if I can do this. Sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. Let's see if I can get this. I'm going to take you up this far, right here. <clears throat> now what you see here is the soul 
of Count Ortiz, visualized as, as a child being born, but not born down into earth, born into heaven. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a birth canal. And this is the kind of thing you'll see in Baroque. You'll see things that are really on the edge, maybe over the edge in some ways, uh, be, but because they're religious art, they're very important. So let me, let me see uh, what else I want to see. Oh, right here, you see these putti, right? Now the putti are cherubs. Now for those of you who were here last time, we talked about this. Cherubim, cherubs, are the second highest order of angels. The highest order of angels are seraphim. If you're in the seraphim rank, your job, if you're an angel, is to take care of God, protect God, be around God. You're, you're bodyguards in a way, but spiritual bodyguards as it were. So this tells you that this red here is going to be married. So the reason you see in all these things of marriage, you see these cherubim, is because it's saying she's second only to God. She's at the very highest rank. The next step up is God. In other words, it's a way of, of, of exclaiming about her incredible importance. And so this, this is the beginning. Now let's pull up and see if we can get this to work again. I'm always hesitant when it comes to doing this sort of thing. Okay. Now here you have Mary on the left. On the right, oddly enough, is John the Baptist. And what he's doing there is another whole question. And, uh, and then here you have the, the, the top of the painting. You have Mary, she's in blue and red. No white. Well, so they're not emphasizing her virginity here. They're emphasizing her motherhood and her divinity. More important. Since she's not on earth anymore. Now guess who this is on the left here. See if you can figure out who this is right here. Now, right? uh, St. Peter. Yes. How did you know? The keys. The keys, the keys to the kingdom. So he's there with the keys to the kingdom. So you have all this metaphor, metaphorical language, right? So on the one hand, there, there's got to be a door to heaven because they're keys, right? But then on the other hand, you have the metaphor of the birth canal. All these are just attempts to try to explain things in a spiritual realm which cannot be explained, right? So this painting is just overwhelming to see. This, by the way, the heavenly hosts of people that have passed into heaven, and they are awaiting their, their good friend, Count Ortiz. Now, I want to point out something really important here that you might not even think about. In Roman Catholic theology, when you die, you don't go to heaven. You don't go straight from the funeral to heaven. You go to purgatory. The purgatory is the way where your sins are purged. Purgatory, see? And since your, your sins are being purged and cleansed, you might be there for a long time. But note, Count Ortiz, right into heaven, see? This, this, in other words, they're saying some things about him here that aren't spoken. In other words, they're saying this man is so good, so holy, no sin that needs to be cleansed, right? Yeah, all right. So this is, <laughs> this is just an amazing piece of work. Oh, and the, and the rendering of Jesus uh, here, well, one of the attributes of El Greco, and you'll see this in Mannerism and in the Baroque, are these long extended arms. That things are kind of stretched like out, and uh, and Jesus has this kind of long arm out, and he then oh, and I believe I believe these are seraphim. See right here with the with the with the, with the 
queens. I believe that's a, a serif. Could be. All right, let's go on here. I want to get out of this. I hope this, and I hope I don't screw it up when I do this. A quick question here before you leave. I did. Was go Jesus ahead. considered God? So Jesus, at this time, yes, Jesus is considered God. Mm -hmm. Again, but the three persons of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So Jesus there to meet him. Uh, all right. Now uh, we're going to now go to uh, some more El Greco. I won't spend that much time on each one of these as I did on the count of teas. Okay, now here you have Mary. Let, let's just pull in on this part of it down here. This is the uh, scene of, of the nativity. And Mary, beautific. And then you have these very, the way that El Greco does these arms, right? Mm -hmm. And the way he does these expressions, and noses especially. And uh, here they are. These are the, the shepherds uh, who aren't overwhelmed. One presumes this is Joseph here in the red. And, and, you, and, and Joseph is seen as an older man, thinning hair, white, white beard. Now look at this. Look at this. Do you see what right is right here? Can you see that? Crescent moon. Yes. Crescent moon. Yeah. What what's the crescent moon just doing sitting in there? Now you go down one day when you don't have anything to do down to Rob, Robin's Museum. I call it Robin's Museum. Uh, <laughs> Robin's Museum called the Meadows Museum. It's at Southern Methodist University. And you look at every painting they have, they're a Mary. And you know what you'll see in every single painting? A moon. Usually crescent, but also sometimes a full moon. Usually just down near her feet, or down below somewhere. What's the moon all about? You, have, you always have the moon and you always have the poodle. Now in this case, we'll, uh, we'll show you that there are some other angels here. This is why, this is, this is where angels trump angels. You know, there's second class angels, then there's first class angels. Mm -hmm. Seraphs are first class angels. So let's go up on this now. See if we can get this to move up. Okay, there, 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 there are the cherubs, of course. But what do we have here on the right? We have a seraph. See? And then what is, what's on the left? This is a, a woman, I think, I think, on the left. Maybe, no, it's hard to say. Maybe a boy on the left. See, who's that? Well, we could probably get into a long discussion about that, but I'm not sure who it is. Remember, this is the nativity, okay? Oh, we just jump to the next one, all right? Uh, let me see if I can get out of this and make this bigger. Now, this is called the Annunciation. This is when Mary learns that she's going to have a child. And you see the pooty? They're not very prominent here. They're, they look like little, little skulls, you know, stacked up, right? Mm -hmm. But they are just faces. This is always, in the art, always puzzle over this. Sometimes you'll just have the face. Sometimes you'll have the face and wings. Sometimes mm -hmm. you'll have the whole body. But one thing you hardly ever have is a smiling poodle. A, a smiling cherub. Why could that be? Hmm. Good question. All right, let's go back down again here and just see if we can see anything else here. Now, this, of course, is Mary before. You've got to remember now. This is before she's had the child. She's just being told. Does she, is, does she have any white on? hard to say if that color is red. She's not a mother yet, because she, she just told. And then what's all this down below here? 
Are, is this a fire? Are these flames? Do you see that? Robin, can you see that? Do you have any idea? Burning bush. Burning bush? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's an enigma to me. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are experts on all these paintings. Right? Okay, let's see if I can get this to go forward again. I have more trouble getting this. Okay, here's El Greco. And let's see if I can get this thing going up. Uh, I'm going to let you interpret it. Tell me what's going on here. No. no. This man, who is, it's, it's really unclear to me what's going on with the blue here, uh, but this man is John the Baptist, and then if we pull up, you'll see Jesus. Okay? Mm -hmm. Baptize him with a shell, and then you'll see the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. And then you'll come higher, and what do we see? Mm -hmm. Ah, it's kind of reminiscent of the birth canal. And then here's God the Father. Now, note, God the Father, white hair, white beard, all white, and God the Father <coughs> is seen as removed. And one thing I've tried to work out is fingers. You often see, you know, the two fingers, uh, and there's lots of discussion about what that means. But um, so here you have one serif, two serifs, three serif, four serifs, five serifs around God, you know, protecting Him, and then kind of in this lower area, you know, in other words somewhat subservient, if you will, by the cherubs who are then going to make it their business to take care of Mary. All right, here we go. Now it's not moving. Let's try it again. Hmm. Paul? Yeah. Uh, who were these uh, paintings intended to be seen by? Church people, people who go to church. To actually went to the church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were in the churches. Yeah. Okay, not in someone's home or... Well, they, I, I'm sure there were some that were bought for by people, but the original intention was, was that. Okay. Uh, and were they used like for religious education or yeah. in... Okay. With sermons? Absolutely. Or? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Because remember, these are illiterate people. That, right. You know, paintings. So the right. priest or somebody standing there and explaining, explaining. everything to the story. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's why you have retablos that are there to, you know, to tell right. a story right. Right. in church and in, and in, in your home, too. Okay, now to see why. Well, I was always taught in art mm -hmm. history that the fingers, the two fingers was symbolic of just of knowledge. Of yeah, I've, I've heard knowledge. that too, and then... But there's the other father, interpretations. Yeah, father and son, I mean... Okay. I've, I've heard all kinds of things, you know, peace sign. <laughs> <laughs> take, take, your, take your dick, right? All right, let's see if I can get this one to come up. All right, now this is El Greco's painting of the Veronica. I need to tell you about the Veronica. When Jesus was carrying the cross to his crucifixion, they, there are certain places he stopped. These are, these are memorialized in every Catholic church. It has the stations of the cross, right? Mm -hmm. And one of these stations is called, one word, Veronica. Now this is Veronica, and, and the story goes something like this. She was, happened to be in Jerusalem that day, just doing something, and along came this uh, procession, and there was a, there were, there were three men carrying crosses, and there were a bunch of soldiers. But she saw Jesus, and he was bleeding blood. 
and sweat, and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't even open his eyes. He was just, it, it was so terrible. And so, just out of impulse, she didn't even think about this. She either takes her handkerchief, her kerchief, um, and grabs it, and goes up and just wipes the blood off his face. And we don't know if anything was said. This thing just happened in a second. And so anyway, Veronica goes home and she's getting ready to wash that handkerchief and she opens it up and there's the face of Jesus. Of course, she knows Jesus. She didn't know the face of the man she saw. She knew that something was really special here. So ultimately, the Veronica becomes the name for this painting, I mean this, this impression of Jesus on, on cloth. And it becomes probably the most important of all relics. Because not only does it have on it the blood of Jesus, it has the face of Jesus. That's the highest status, if you will, of, uh, of relics. Because it, it, it's a twofer. So people would go to Rome, to St. Peter's, to see this. And if you, if you kneeled in front of this, Veronica, when it was shown, for one hour, you'd get 28,000 years on purgatory. 28,000. <laughs> see, and this sounds like a huge number, but nobody knows if you're in purgatory for a million years. And uh, I know I'll be there a long time. Uh, and then there are people like Count Ortiz, they get to skip, right? Mother Teresa, skip, and so forth. Uh, so this, this shows you, though, he's very deeply. Roman Catholic in his thinking, even though he was raised Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. So it's kind of an interesting twist on the, on the whole thing. All right, a little bit more of El Greco here. Okay. This is a very, very famous painting by El Greco based on a story from the Trojan War. Let's see if I can uh, get up here to the right spot, right here. There we go, and I'm gonna make this bigger. Now, the name of this, I should write this up for you because this is a most important thing. This is his L-A-O-C-O-O-N. La Laokion. Laokion. The Laokion is a serpent, a snake, uh, maybe a sea creature that attacks, and you can see part of the snake's body down here, uh, uh, attack, uh, I said it backward. Laokian is this man, and the sea serpent attacked him and his two sons in Troy. Now it's ironic that Troy is actually, if you know Toledo, you know that's Toledo, mm -hmm. right? So he, he used Toledo as a background. But what happened is in the Trojan War, he was, he was the guy who told him that the horse was dangerous. And he put a spear through it, and this angered a... Um, Athena so much that she she uh, sent down the snakes for him and the boys. Now, if you look at this from the from the standpoint of, of painting, I mean this is a very modern painting, right? Because first of all, it's every, everything very exposed, and you have all of this, you know, these flesh and these these undulations and accentuations that are just quite extraordinary. Uh, and it is, there's a little teeny thing in here, I don't think you see it. I'm gonna point it out. 
that is a Trojan horse, <laughs> which looks every much like a real horse, right? And uh, so I, I am you know, always interested in what El Greco is up to. But when you see an El Greco, you know it's an El Greco instantly. Let's see if I can get this. You know what's odd is that it's the only nude that I see. Was, yeah. Except for the uh, angels. Yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know that that one was intended for church. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it was not. Probably a palace somewhere. Now I showed you these last time, but this is, uh, Robin, is this one? Yeah, this is one in your museum here. It's one of them. Huh? It's one of them. Yeah, there's things. several, of course. Let me see what I can go up here. It looks so, so many of them look similar. It, oh, this is Palomino? Yeah, this is Palomino, correct. This is Palomino, and the thing that you want to note, the white, the blue, and then the little belt of red to, to inform you that she is now pregnant. So this is called the Immaculate Conception, except that Mary has now conceived. So that, that's important. But let's see, let's go down a little bit farther here. Well, maybe we won't go anywhere, I don't know. Okay, so I'm gonna have to try to push it around and see if I can do that. All right, now you see the pootie here? See all the pootie? Oh, and by the way, what flowers associated with Mary? The lily on the left and the rose on the right. And then you have right behind her, what do you have? Can you see it on the left, on your left? Because of the glaring here, you can't see it very clearly. I can see it very clearly. Is you have just a little piece of the moon. In other words, the moon is behind her. Yeah. And, uh, and then again, are the pooties smiling, laughing? No, no. Very serious indeed. Very serious indeed. And then this is another, this is one by, and I'm hoping I can get it to. This is, um, hang on, oh, uh, Ribera. And let's see if I can get this to go up a little bit. One of the, th one of the attributes here is, this is uh, St. Andrew's martyrdom. St. Andrew was, um, I think he was shot through with arrows. But anyway, notice the light in the dark. This becomes a characteristic of the Broke. Uh, and the farther north you get, the darker it gets. The term we use is chiaroscuro. All right, let's, um, now I think we, do we have one more? No, I think we're done with this one. So now we're going to go to, uh, I think we'll do the Flemish. Yeah, I think we'll do the, the French, the Flemish, and so forth. All right. Oh, I wanted to show you now something. If we can get it up. Ah, now let me make it bigger. I think you might recognize this. This is the most, I, I would think of all the famous Baroque rooms in the world, this might be one of the most famous. This is the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. It's like a <coughs> monumental stage set. It's so strange to be in there because on the one hand, it's dead art. It's the cold, the whole thing is very cold. You, you don't have a sense of that anybody ever lived here. It's, it's, it's like a colossal resort and the, the aristocrats wanting to be close to the king, Louis XIV, who built the, the Versailles, they would all have rooms. I mean, it has hundreds and hundreds of rooms and, uh, and thousands and thousands of servants. But if you go to Versailles, what really interests me, they have, the royals built a little peasant village near the Versailles so they could take all, off all of that, their wigs and clothes, and dress up like peasants and go spend the time down in their in their own little personal private uh, village and you know slum around like you know ordinary people. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like going to Disneyland in a way. Mm. You know, it's, it's, they're trying to create an alternate 
reality or something like that. Okay, let's see if we can go next here. All right, now this is a, this is a real highlight. This is by Georges de la Tour. Uh, I want to show you, this is, name of this one, this is St. Jerome. St. Jerome, Jerome is famous for translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. It's called the Vulgate. And this is still the official Catholic Bible. And we talked about it before. Now they have a single candle here, and he's reading by it. But again, how beautiful the illumination is, how effective the light is in terms of candlelight versus daylight, right? Uh, stunning. So that, that's, uh, George's is very deeply, of course, into the Baroque. Here's another example uh, by the same man. This one is called um, Joseph and the Carpenter. In other words, this is Joseph and the young Jesus. I'm sorry, why, why it does all these things? I don't know. It just will not get rid of that. They're fine. It's amazing how the, the painting it looks like somehow they put a little like electric light yeah. in the middle or, or at the child's face. Yeah. And it's just color. Yeah. It's just crazy how. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's really a, a good when you can see it in high resolution. See, you, there's so much glare mm -hmm. on the screen. You can't see how that light just glows on his face and makes him look very, very angelic in a way. <clears throat> and Joseph, again, is pictured as an old man uh, who is. You know, doing some carpentry work there. All right. Now here's here's one of the most famous paintings in the Dallas Museum of Art. This is a painter, a French painter named Pierre. And again, what are the characteristics of Roque? Dramatic grandeur. Movement, this sense of movement, this sense of, of, of dark and light. In this case, the dark here is the eagle. The eagle represents Zeus. But Zeus is also in the, in the bowl here. This is a famous painting of the rape of Europa. Now, Europa was a princess. And she's... A, 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 a beautiful but naive young girl and one day she's out and walking around and this bowl just beautifully somebody has decorated the bowl and the bowl seems very docile and she thinks you know how how nice it would be because I want to cross this stream here just to ride the bowl across he's so gentle and so of course the bowl is in fact uh, Zeus so this is, you'll notice up here, we have the Pudi again. Now what are the Pudi doing in here? So the Pudi moved from... Are they Pudi or are they cherubs here? Well, no, they're, 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 they're Pudi, but, but the, that's like a distinction. It's like a distinction without a difference. There is a distinction between cherubs. Cherubs are these angelic beings, but the Pudi are the artistic version of these cherubs. And so, there, if you do a close-up on this one, there's, there's a puzzle on this one that I've worried about for years, and I'm gonna show it to you if I can get to it. Uh, come on, see if we can go here. Ah! And I don't, it's just causing me all kinds, it's not cooperating. Let me try this, this technique here. Hmm. There we go, finally. Let me see if I can get this come down a little bit more. Okay. This, this, this pooty on, on the right ear of the pooty, uh, this poodle, I mean, is this growth. It's really weird when you see it in person. Uh, you can't see it so well here. Uh, but when you're down to DMA, boy, it really shows up. Anyway, why is she wearing red? Well, that's to imply what's about to happen to her. 
This is what they call foreshadowing. She's about to become a mother. But anyway, she's very happy, just innocent. And here is Zeus, ominous, dark, over here brooding. And as soon as he gets across the stream, then uh, Zeus rapes her. And her progeny then are called what? Europeans. This is, the, this is why Europeans, according to the tradition, have this idea that they're descended from Zeus. Through, uh, that explains a lot. Yeah, that explains a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. But anyway, okay. Now, uh, you have to go see this in person. I mean, this is just a knockout of a painting, and it's you. And it's very, very, uh, let's see if I can get it to go down here to see the sea creatures. Is that a characteristic of Baroque art also to be uh, larger paintings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah larger than life, mm -hmm. overwhelming, everything uh, highlighted, dramatized, technicolor, right? Mm -hmm. And and so back in a time when people saw most everything in black and white, they go in and see these paintings, and they were just they were just enraptured. And uh, I, you know, it's hard not to be. The sea creatures in here. Now, is the sea creature probably Poseidon? Yes, I would say that's a good possibility, because again, this is his brother. He and his brother kind of do t a tag team thing sometimes uh, to get to get the women. But anyway, uh, uh, this this is uh, Pierre is a real master of this. Um, okay, let's let's see if we can leave this one. How are we doing on time? Not well, not well at all. It's going way too fast. Okay, this is. A more famous French painter by the name of Boucher. And Boucher, let's see if we can get this. Okay, see the pooty again? Now, what, 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 what are the pooty always about? Uh, the the, the, the pooty are about um, <coughs> emphasizing the, the purity the purity and the innocence of whoever the young lady is. Now, I have mismarked this on my file here, and so I have this, I don't know who this is exactly, I should know. It might be, I'm not gonna guess, that's dangerous. So I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna leave this one, go forward, come on, come on, there we go. Okay, here he is, uh, Latour again, this time, this is Mary Magdalene. So let me let me blow up Mary Magdalene for you and see what you think about Mary Magdalene. So Mary Magdalene, by the way. Now, it's showing her in very different kind of clothing in a way than you would think. But she is carrying a skull here, so there's some ominous quality to this. I don't know what it is. All right. Now I want to move over to Rembrandt. Yeah, yeah, the Dutch. Yeah. They're the most famous of all Rembrandt paintings. And Rembrandt's one of the most famous of all the painters. It's famous in Night Watch. So these two men are going out leading a, a group of, of soldiers on a night watch through, through the town. So in, in a way it's kind of a prosaic. There's nothing particularly dramatic here other than the way Rembrandt treats it. The heavy use of chiaroscuro. So how these men are lit up and how this girl's lit up and then how these characters kind of fade into the background. It's it, it, and the it, hand. And the so, hand. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. center, yeah. Right. And the hand sticking out it yeah. almost mm -hmm. gives it a three dimensional quality. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something I wanted to show you about the Baroque. This is by a man named Steen. Now, this is just a rather, I wouldn't say ordinary, but it's just it's a painting of people uh, having their, having a little party, and they're dancing, and this kind of thing, and everybody's having a good time. The fiddler is up here, and so forth. 
Now, you might say, well, so what's the big deal about this? You do, except for one or two medieval painters, you do not see ordinary people in paintings in this, at this time frame in the 17th century. That doesn't come until the 19th century. Here's Vermeer's most famous, well, maybe not his most famous painting, but certainly very well-known painting, uh, The Girl with the Pearl, and uh, quite, quite dramatic, is his treatment of the eyes, and uh, just trying to capture the energy of this young lady. All right, I'm going to try to wrap this up. Oh, I love this one. This is my favorite Vermeer here. And let me tell you, see if I can get this bigger so you can get, oh, oops, a little too big there. There we go. Now, all it is is girl pouring milk. But the lighting, my God, the lighting is fantastically amazing of how, how realistic it is and how realistic the book is. But, but again, point out, the fact that you have a major painting on a person who is of the servant class, this is a, 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 a maid most likely, and, and yet there she is. <coughs> so th this is one thing we start to see. <coughs> Okay, this is um, Rubens. All right, I want to talk. I want to finish with Rubens. Rubens is not Dutch but Flemish, which is you know Belgium today, Catholic. And here you have Mary ascending into heaven with the Pudi all around her. It's a very kind of overly dramatic scene. And then let's see. I'm going to do one more here. I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to do this one right. Come on. No, nope, that's not it. Sorry. Pop past it. Let's do this one. I'll end on this one. I also want to show you, but I'll do it next week. Rubenesque. You've heard of the expression Rubenesque. This is a painting of Jesus being brought down from the cross. From the cross. <coughs> It's so, so very dramatic, so very pointed, very emotional, okay, very emotional. That was the point of a painting like that. Okay, yeah, I've run out of time. Um, let's let's open the lights here so we can just uh, at least get, see each other. Get some more lights on. Here. Yeah. All right. Now, here here's what I plan to do. Uh, next week, so I hope you can come. I'm going to now show you how the Baroque then just just spreads through the entire art world. And by that, I don't, I mean the arts, or I should say humanities world. So we'll see this going to music, we'll see it go into uh, sculpture, we haven't done much sculpture. We'll see it go into literature, we'll see it go into plays. Unbelievable. Unbelievable the impact of this, particularly up north. You know, up north where there was no great uh, love for the Roman Catholic Church, but they loved Rome. A uh, Rembrandt, for example, Rembrandt's in Holland, for goodness' sake, and yet he he's as much into broke as anybody, because he loves the style. Okay, any questions or comments? Anything anybody want to add or detract? Sorry for all the technical glitches. We do the best we can with what we got. This is kind of a cherry rig deal here. Could you say a bit about, mm -hmm. you talk about it as being any uh, reformation. Yeah. So this was an attempt that may have started in the church but went beyond the church. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah, right. In other words, to, religious. To uh, bring mm -hmm. uh, more color and uh, spectacle, spectacle, drama, that, all right, all okay, mm -hmm. so that's, yeah. okay. Now, uh, again, it was in just one branch of the Protestant Reformation, the Calvinists, where this yeah. iconoclastic right. business was so strong, but they, but it's, after all, the, the Protestants that settled America in the beginning, all of New England, 
Calvinist. New York State, Calvinist. Pennsylvania, Calvinist. And then, then, you, and then uh, you, you have the Quakers and so on. All, the, all the, these, so many of these people are iconoclastic. So what, what it, it, it's an example of how our art can spread in ways, spread ideas and concepts in ways that uh, the dominant culture doesn't particularly accept. Yeah, some of those early mm -hmm. churches that you talk about in New England, the Puritan, mm -hmm. uh, the, even the, the glass is plain. Yeah. But later, then stained glass began to show they up. Put it, yeah. And we can see stained glass yeah. in a lot of products. Right. Pro yeah. products that, that, and that was somehow okay because you weren't you were it, you weren't showing images, but then then they started putting in little okay. stories in stories in, right, right out of the Catholic Church. The Episcopalians did it first, right. yeah. which is Catholic yeah. light, and then <laughs> and then, the, yeah, and and then yeah. yeah, and then and then it moves to the Methodists, and the Methodists have always been a halfway house. You know, there's some art, there's some color, there's some music, but yeah, yeah, so to speak is right. Or, but then on the other hand, not so extremely iconoclastic. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. See you. All right. Yeah. See you next time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.